Hi, welcome back. Uh, I'm Paul Gilday. Um, you might have, have seen me on the previous module. Uh, and so I'm here with Edgar Bangero. And today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, building cross-platform applications uh, with WinJS. Um, so Edgar, please uh, introduce yourself. So hi, I'm Edgar Bangero. I'm a senior software engineer here in the WinJS team. Um, working at Microsoft for almost eight years in different web services. Um, such as what is now known as Outlook.com and OneDrive. Um, previously, I worked on the Windows web apps platform, uh, building uh, the framework that enables developers to build applications in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, most recently, I worked with Paul and the WinJS team in our effort to bring the WinJS library cross-platform and ensuring that it works well in every, like in Safari, in Chrome, in every browser, and in especially with Cordova applications. And then I, I'm from Colombia, so I will add Spanish to the uh, list of AdSense that you heard <laughs> this morning. Uh, so let's let's get started. Yeah. So um, what we're going to cover today is we're going to cover a little bit about uh, what's WinJS, what's going on in WinJS. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive in uh, some of these WinJS concepts, especially around our control model. Uh, and then once we've kind of learned those things, I'm going to hand it over to Edgar, and Edgar's going to uh, show us a demo app uh, that we built uh, using Apache Cordova, WinJS, um, and he can, we can kind of dissect it and show you uh, the stuff that we've been doing uh, to enable WinJS cross-platform. And so the, the first uh, thing that we're going to talk about is what is WinJS? Um, and within that, I'm just going to give you a brief in intro and show you kind of where our roadmap is. Um, so WinJS uh, today is a, a set of JavaScript toolkits. Um, and we, we have two main uh, toolkits. And the first toolkit is really around uh, UI, UI controls and widgets, um, specifically high-polished widgets uh, that are centered around performance. And um, we believe that these widgets are, uh, are great aspects to your application because we've designed them with both uh, with all of touch, keyboard, mouse, accessibility uh, built right into the, the, the UI components. On the other side, we have lots of infrastructure uh, so that you can scaffold out your application. Um, we have things like uh, a scheduler that lets you uh, schedule all of your tasks for your UI and allows you to coordinate um, calls across it. Uh, we have data binding. Um, we have a promises implementation uh, that's uh, very compatible with the new ES6 promises that are, that are coming. Um, and uh, we have pages infrastructure, so a lot, of, a lot of good infrastructure to actually build up your application. And so many of you might not know um, is that uh, we actually started this back in Windows 8 um, and with WinJS 1. And so this was originally a JavaScript library that developers used to build Windows 8 applications. Um, and so if you look at our timeline here, uh, fast forward to, uh, to April, um, this past April, at the Build Conference, we announced that we were with, uh, partnering with Microsoft OpenTech. Um, Microsoft OpenTech released uh, WinJS as an open source uh, project. And we announced that we were going to take the project cross-browser and cross-device. Um, this past September, uh, we actually had our first cross-platform, cross-device release with WinJS 3.0. Um, where we have a, a support matrix of a slew of desktop, desktop and mobile browsers. We worked heavily on making it modular and making sure that you could get it from your various package managers that you use today um, with all the other JavaScript libraries that you know and love. Um, and so that's where, uh, where we are in the future. Um, you can kind of see what we're thinking about. Um, and uh, we're on GitHub, and we encourage you to go there and uh, participate with us, uh, issue pull requests, feature requests, what have you. Um, we're really interested in what you, the developers, want uh, to see in, in our library. And so with that, um, we're going to talk a little bit 
about uh, some of just the, the basic WinJS concepts to get you up and running with a WinJS uh, application. And so the three things uh, that I'm going to touch on are how do you kind of bootstrap your app with WinJS? Uh, talk a little bit about the control model that we have so that you can instantiate controls and use them in your UI. And then we'll touch a little bit on data binding to kind of bring your application to life by marrying your data with your UI. Cool. So with that, I'm going to switch over to uh, our try site here. And so um, since we, we want open source, uh, you can see we have a, uh, a nice uh, plethora of controls. And uh, Edgar's going to talk a little bit more about those specific controls. Um, but here at the try site, we have interactive demos for you. And so hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to code this demo straight up in, in our website. And so the first thing that I, I talked about was that we're going to talk a little bit about bootstrapping. And so like many other JavaScript libraries, um, we have a, a ready function, which uh, kind of abstracts DOM content loaded, document load, all that good stuff, so that you, you know that you're ready and up and running to, to run this application. We uh, like jQuery's dollar ready. We have our winjs.application on ready function. Um, and so the thing that we're going to do here is we're going to uh, start building a demo. And so here I'm just going to give this demo uh, a title here. And we'll just say rating demo. And so here we're going to actually be instantiating rating controls. Um, and so the first thing to know about uh, our control model is that there's three key aspects to it um, in order to instantiate a control. And so the first thing is you need an element. Uh, next is you need a constructor. And then optionally, you can pass an object of configuration settings um, for that control. And so uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a placeholder element. Uh, and I'm going to give it a class name of rating so that we know we can select it out of the DOM for later. And so uh, we're going to do just that. So here I'm going to create a variable. And then um, I'm going to use the uh, query selector um, method to actually go to the DOM. And then we're going to find our, our rating element. And we're going to scroll that away into a variable. And so uh, the way that we initialize this control is we just call new with a constructor. Um, and so I'm going to initialize a rating control. And we're going to call new. Uh, and our, most of our UI widgets live in the UI namespace. And so that's just UI rating. And in our constructor, you can see that uh, we need to pass an element, and so a reference to our element, as well as any uh, options for configuration on, on the data. And so I'm going to pass that element that we selected out of the DOM. I'm going to pass uh, an initial uh, user rating. Um, we'll set that value to, uh, actually, we'll set it to 3 in the middle here. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll finish that code. And so hopefully, um, we've instantiated a rating control. That's great. And so if you can see here, as I hover over with my mouse, you can see the tentative rating is giving me hover feedback. I can click on uh, each of the stars to, uh, to commit that user rating. Um, I can also, uh, if I move the mouse here, I can keyboard around uh, to use keyboard to set that tentative rating. Press Enter to uh, commit that as well. Um, also, you notice as I touch on the screen here, I can set ratings. And I can also scrub over top of that. And so this is just an example of the type of care that we've put into all of our controls to ensure that we have the right uh, input modality support. So you can take a WinJS control um, from a, a phone, scale it up to a tablet, to a desktop PC, and then um, scale that across other devices uh, that may or may not have keyboards and mice attached to them, um, or touch-first touch uh, devices such as your, your Android and your iOS devices. So that's pretty cool. Um, awesome. And so uh, I showed you the programmatic side of how we knew up a control. Um, like many other uh, JavaScript frameworks, we have some uh, declarative ways of instantiating controls. And so I'm going to do that. Um, and so interesting enough, we're actually going to build on top of this. And so uh, before I do that, let's look over at the HTML. And so the way that, uh, that I declare a control is the same way that I would do imperatively is that I need an HTML element, I need a constructor, and I need uh, options configuration. And so uh, we decided to leverage the HTML5 data dash uh, attributes to do this. And so um, I can type data win control and then pass that the same uh, winjs.ui.rating constructor uh, that we used in the previous example. Um, and then to pass in our configuration data, we use data win options. 
And uh, we have a very similar uh, JSON-like syntax to do that. And so I'll say user rating, and we'll set this to two. And then um, on our script side, uh, we need to process that, uh, that markup in order to instantiate that control. And we use that with the control processor, and that lives in the UI namespace. So if I type in winjs.ui.processall, and so what this will do is when we call this, it will comb through our uh, HTML document. It'll find all of the instances of our data win controls. It'll hook up our constructor uh, with the uh, options configuration and then marry that with the HTML element that, we're, uh, that we've attributed with uh, these attributes. And so hopefully, uh, now you'll see that we have still our same rating control with a, a rating of two. Um, I can also add in some more configuration just to ensure that this is uh, you know, live running code. So I can set uh, a max rating here, uh, and we'll set that to 10. And so hopefully on the, uh, the output here, now you can see that uh, this output is, um, is generating and instantiating our controls with the, uh, the things that we want and we need. Um, so the, the final thing that I was going to talk a little bit about is data binding. And uh, if you'll, you'll see in, in our, our future sample that um, we do a lot of data binding uh, in our application. We think this is kind of a, a first class concept. Um, and so we talked about programmatic side, the declarative side of uh, control instantiation. And so we have similar concepts for, for binding as well. And so I'm going to choose to just kick off with some uh, some declarative uh, data binding. And so we use the same data dash attributes. So I'll type in data win um, bind. And for our binding expressions, uh, we can bind to essentially anything that's a property in the JavaScript domain. And so we think this is really handy so that um, as you uh, become more comfortable with our binding system, uh, anything that you can bind to, any property that you can set in JavaScript essentially becomes a bindable property in our binding system. Uh, and so in, in this specific case, I'm going to bind to the ratings, uh, the user rating property. And the way that we do that is that there's a, a well-known property that we apply to HTML elements called the win control um, property. And this gives us an instance uh, to our control. And then off of that, I can bind to a user rating. Um, and so this expression is property colon uh, source. And so we're going to pass in some, uh, some data, and we'll show you that on the other side of the imperative side. Um, and we're going to set that to uh, our data and our rating value. So let's go back over into our script, and let's kind of set up uh, some of our, our data here. And so let me click here, and we'll put this down here. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a namespace. I'm going to use WinJS's um, namespace uh, define function. We're going to create the namespace app. Inside of that app namespace, we're going to uh, create a, uh, a context object. Um, inside of that context object, we're going to have a data object, um, and, uh, and that's all we need. And so the interesting thing with our binding, uh, like our control instantiation, there's kind of three key parts um, that you need to understand when using data binding. And those parts are is you have some data object um, that could be an array, it could be an object with properties on it. Um, you have some piece of UI that has properties that you want to bind to. And then we wrap that together with an observable proxy that kind of connects those two things together. And then as you update uh, that observable proxy, um, the UI will, will update for your binding. And so uh, actually what I'm going to do here is I'm going to kind of preset some of this stuff up. And I'm going to have a, an event handler. And we're going to call this. Um, uh, We'll set this up as our add one event handler because we're going to be changing some values. Um, and WinJS actually has a nice little helper function here that marks our uh, event handler supported for processing. And so if I, we'll leave this empty for now, but this will help us set up in the future. Perfect. Okay, great. And so now you can imagine um, after you've called process all, which is uh, an asynchronous method, so um, this returns a promise. And so once that po promise completes, um, we need to go do some work. And so some of that work is that you can imagine going to talk to your, uh, your data service on the back end, um, get some JSON blob, do a JSON.parse on it, and now you have some object model that you want to bind to your UI. And so uh, in lieu of doing all that, we'll, we'll just bind to some, some, static, da some static data. And so uh, the way that we do that is uh, we use winjs. Uh, 
dot binding dot as. And so we're just going to pass this in an object that has a rating property. And we'll set that rating to, uh, to 6 here. So actually, you know what? We'll set it to 1. So we'll want to show some of the, the cool binding stuff. Great. And then what we'll do is we'll export that um, as part of our data context. So if I do data, uh, app.context.data equals winjs.binding.as of our data object. So we, we've now uh, exposed that as, as an observable proxy. And so now the way that we wire up our declarative, uh, our declarative binding is with our binding processor. So very similar to our control processor is our binding processor. That lives in the binding namespace. And so I just call uh, process all. And then I uh, apply null here. So that just means, hey, let's do this over the entire DOM. And then I'm going to pass in that context. Um, and so hopefully, with all of the correct magic, when I hit output, we'll see if this actually worked. Great. It worked first time. Awesome. Uh, you'll see that we have uh, our rating. Um, instead of statically defining it uh, in our options in our HTML, and actually, actually, you can see, look, it actually overwrote our initial value of 2. And so we actually know that binding is actually working. Um, let's just do uh, another small task just to ensure that it's actually working. So we're going to have a button here. Um, and we're going to actually data bind to it as well. And so that's the nice thing about WinJS is once you understand that um, you can just bind to any JavaScript property, then you can apply these bindings not only to our JavaScript controls, but also to, our, to all of the intrinsic HTML controls as well. And so what we're going to do here is I'm going to do a data win bind, and we're going to bind to the, uh, the click, the on click uh, property of this button. And we're going to bind that to uh, our event handlers that we had in the, the previous context. And I believe I called it add one. And so I'll just give this button a label. And so now if I go back into our script, we have our add one event handler in our event handler namespace here. And then all I'm going to do here is update that observable proxy that uh, we exported here. And so now if I just call app dot uh, context.data.rating, which is our rating control, or rating property, mind you. And if we just do a plus plus, hopefully when we run the output and I click this button, you can see the value of that rating control uh, going up, which is great. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to end this demo. So this is very the simplistic, basic kind of building blocks of WinJS. And now Edgar is going to take those concepts and he's going to uh, you know, expand those out to the various JavaScript controls that we have in WinJS and what he did uh, in, the, uh, in our Cordova sample to bring a WinJS application uh, cross-platform. So let me switch back to the slides here to give us a little bit more context for everyone. Um, and so now I'm going to hand it over to Edgar, and he's going to talk about all the fun stuff that we've done uh, with the app uh, stock sample. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. So, uh, Ned, let's take a look at my screen. Um, and we are going to, this is the application that we're going to be building. Uh, it's a sample stocks app. Many of you may be familiar with this UI. It, we actually released a version of this application when, as part of the Windows A developer preview. And now we are being able, we are using the code to uh, create a Cordova app now that uh, WinJS is cross-platform. Uh, something that I want to call out is the code is available in GitHub. So you guys can go and dig and into the code and open issues or ask questions, and we will be happy to, to answer. So before we build this um, app, let's take a look at four main controls that are going to be the core of this stocks app. Uh, first is the list view. The list view control is one of our most popular controls. And it handles displaying large amounts of data. And it visualizes the elements of the DOM. Uh, it supports multiple layouts, grouping, edits. It handles all the animations when the data source changes. And it handles um, mouse, keyboard, touch, all of those things too, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, one of our, it's one of the main controls. Uh, next, we will look at, we will be using an app bar control. Um, one interesting part about going cross-platform is that when we were in Windows 8, we used to have these app bar commands using uh, symbols from Sego UI. And as soon as we went um, cross-platform, we decided to open source a web font um, that includes 
the main and extended set of icons, uh, and it allows um, different controls such as the app bar, the nav bar, to be able to refer to those icons uh, and work in Android, in iOS, and in platforms that don't necessarily have the Windows Sego UI font. Um, you can also use it in your own custom content, as this sample shows. Cool. And that's, so now, that's on our GitHub, right? Yes. Awesome. Cool. So now let's take a look at the code. Um, this is the application running in the simulator. Um, the main um, the main the main control here is the pivot control. Right. Um, the pivot control has different events that allow the application to know whenever the selection change, and then we are able to display different content. Um, it also manages making sure that there is only one view displayed at, at a time. The pivot control is, uh, let's take a look at the structure of this page. Right. But this uh, is, this, and this is actually a, a Cordova application, right? Exactly. This isn't a web page. You're actually running WinJS inside of Cordova targeting iOS. Exactly. You can imagine that you are able to use the Visual Studio um, uh, to create the Cordova, right. the multi-device hybrid application, or you can use the command line, Cordova create stocks app, and then in this case, we are using iOS, so we created um, the folder structure using the command line, and then we reference uh, WinJS. WinJS is, you can include, create your own custom build of WinJS, or you can include the entire WinJS. Uh, there is some, one mail style sheet um, that reference all the styles and rules for the controls that we will be using, as well as the reference to a web font that we need for uh, different platforms. Awesome. So this is just a regular Cordova application using WinJS is just like a regular JavaScript library. Exactly. Perfect. Um, so first, let's take a look at the main structure of the uh, the main kind of like the main element of the in the search HTML. It contains a pivot control. Uh, the pivot can be configured to have a title, which we see like right here. Then there are different items. Uh, there is a watch list, there is a market section, and there is a news section. Uh, we will drill down later into the content of those items. You can pretty much put any content you want in our in our scenario. We are just we happen to put list views in the three tabs. Right. Uh, below, we also see that there is functionality to add um, to search for different stocks and add it to your watch list. And then towards the bottom, we will see an app bar, which allows you to ha list all the control, all the commands that we will be using in the different tabs, like add, edit, delete. Um, the markets has an option to toggle between list and grid. And we will detect in the pivot control when uh, we are in a given tab and show only the commands that are, that are appropriate for that. Uh, a specific um, scenario. Cool. So let's and so the actual the actual markup that you're showing here is using those exact same concepts that we talked about earlier, where you're using data wind control to instantiate your app bar. You're passing it some data through the options. Um, that's great. Absolutely. So, so all of our controls follow that same pattern, the same model. So if you learn it for one, it applies for all of the other ones that we have. Correct. So let's let's take a look at the uh, at one of the tabs in this uh, pivot um, control. So let's take a look at a simple one, the news one. Uh, you can see that we have a news, a list view. Uh, two of the main, as Paul mentioned, you can specify options. Right. Uh, for the control, so that when process all is um, invoked, it uses this, it uses these settings. Uh, two of the main ones for the list view are the item data source and the item template. Uh, the item template indicates what every item is going to look like. So, for instance, in this case, we are using a news item template, which is defined here, and is using binding oh. again. And then there is a title, which is this top section. And then there is a description, which is the, a preview of the article. The item data source, uh, we use in this scenario a binding list, which is uh, a proxy to a list. And it allows you to simply have data in an array and 
be able to do edits, and it handles sending the notifications to the list view um, to handle animations, et cetera. Right, so we have observable objects, and we can have observable arrays in MinJS as well. Exactly. And you could have observable arrays with observable objects inside of that as well. Correct. Cool. Uh, that was a simple item template. That you can go as complex as, as you want. Uh, in this case here, we can see for the watch list, uh, it's using a watch list item template, uh, which contains a canvas that is used to throw this chart, and then stock details, which is the section that includes all the information about this particular stock. And then we can see that uh, this is just list. Um, great. So let's go down and let's drill down into default. So one of the main sections that I wanted to show about default is um, there is an event. Uh, you can get a reference to the pivot, to the main pivot control, and then there is an event that uh, allows you to know whenever the user changed the selected tab, uh, and it is the selection change event. So here, every time that we are getting a new selection, we invoke uh, the show uh, method in our three tabs. So we set up the structure of this project as we have one file for every tab. So all the logic for the market tab is here, for the news tab is here, and for the watch list. So every time the selection change is triggered, uh, we look at the selected index, and then we call the appropriate show function. Right. So this is essentially the, the main of your application. This is your, your app shell that's going to coordinate uh, all of the logic between each of your uh, pivot items. Correct. So Every application needs data. That is what makes it exciting. And in this case, we built a small um, Azure mold service that is going to return um, JSON. And then, so we can, for instance, look at the get, that is get stocks info, get stocks history, get news, get market. Um, the way that this works is we create. We, can, we are using something called Win, WinJS.hhr, which pretty much does an XML HTTP request to a URL, and then it returns uh, a promise with the data. And then we can use this data, and we can return it in the promise. Um, and so that's a pattern most applications are going to follow um, when they want to hook up to external services. Correct. Um, or hook up to Azure, and we're using mobile, uh, mobile services as an example of, of how, to, how to leverage that. Correct. So this, in this screen right now, we have an example of the JSON object that is returned whenever we call get markets. And then we take that, uh, we take that JSON object, and then we return it whenever the tab needs the data to provide it to the binding list that is going to uh, be displayed in the list view. Right. So if we look at the news tab, we saw earlier that the show method is getting called in the news whenever we switch to, um, to the news tab. Uh, the first thing we're, we, we can notice is the market tab shows an app bar, the watch list shows an app bar with different content. The news one doesn't need an app bar, so in this case we are hiding it. And then the first time that we get to this um, tab in the pivot control, we are making the call to get news, which, as we saw earlier, is a helper that returns a promise with items. And then we take those items and then we push them to a binding list. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the binding list is a proxy to a, a list. And we can see that the news, in this case, stocks that news the list is configured in the news tab uh, in the news list as the item data source, right there. So, so that is great. Let's, let's and then, look at are you passing the uh, the the new the stocks uh, context in through your um, through your binding? Is that? Oh, I'm sorry, it's through your options. That's right. Right. The gotcha. the list view has an item data source, right. and then it's configured the data Perfect. source. OK. Uh, one other thing that we can also see another interesting um, property in the list view is the on item invoked. Here we can see that there is, it's calling this event handler, which we see here. So okay. one of the interesting things with Cordova is that you can use plugins uh, to be able to um, like access device capabilities that you wouldn't necessarily be able to 
to call from regular JavaScript. Right. And then they do the abstraction for you, and then they handle uh, every platform that it supports. So in this case, whenever um, an item is invoked, we are calling the URL that the, that particular item that was um, clicked, um, and then we open the the system browser, as we can see here. Like we don't have connection in the in this emulator. So let's go back to um, dun, dun, cool. here. And oh, and that's and you use the Cordova plugin because not all uh, HTML platforms support opening uh, windows on on that specific platform. Correct. If we actually look at uh, the every time that you do Cordova platform add iOS, they generate an Netscode project for you that also has the same structure. And yep. you can actually see that in the case of iOS, that plugin added um, the CDV in browser that M and that H files. Um, that handle opening, interacting with the, with the native API right. that does the, the opening of the system browser. The market stab is very similar to what we just show. The only difference here is that there is a little bit of extra logic to configure the, um, the app bar. If we detect that the list is being displayed right now as a grid, we allow them to toggle and then display it as a lead. So we have some logic that invokes an upper API called show only commands, where you can um, narrow the set of commands that we had initially in the upper, all these commands, right. and then display only the ones that are appropriate for, for this particular scenario. Uh, when we go now to the watch list, the watch list is the most complicated. No, it's not complicated. It's just uh, a lot of more code, because it does a lot. Um, it handles retrieving the data, like in this show method. It handles retrieving the data for every chart, the historical data, plus the info data. And then um, it handles edits. We can go ahead and say, oh, I want to edit the list and delete a particular stock. Um, and then it also handles, handles adding a stock. So we use for this, we use a search box control. And then if we look at the selected here, we have a suggestions requested event that gets triggered every time that we type um, something in the, in the text box. So we can go and look at the code of what we're doing in this handler. Um, this handler gets triggered. We look at the query that the user is currently typing. We have a pre-generated list of recommendations. And then we look to see if there is one of these is, is, a, is a substream of the, of the suggestions. And if they are, we go ahead and we add it to, to the suggestions list of the search box control. Uh, whenever a suggestion is chosen or a query is um, submitted by clicking on this search icon, uh, we go ahead and call a handler called add stock handler, uh, which we will see defined here. Uh, it, this section is pretty much going and using, again, our data helper, getting the stock information, these details for, the, for this particular stock, getting the, histor the history data for that particular stock, uh, using promises um, to join the retrieval of those two pieces of information. Because those are two separate network calls that you actually need to coordinate together. So once you have all of that information, you can then update the UI. Exactly. Um, and then we go ahead and add it to the, uh, to the list. And then we persisted. Here, we add it to the list. Mm -hmm. And then we persisted um, to local storage just the, the symbol, the TSLA um, symbol. That way, the next time that the user launches the application again, they have the, the customized set of stocks that they added to, to the application. Um, and then the, the list that you were, you're editing, that's the, the backing binding list to this specific list view uh, in the watch list. And when you did that, we saw all of those, you know, a fancy fade-in animation, and it pushed all of the other items down. And that was all done for you. Correct. 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 The, and that's um, all done using CSS transform, so it's hardware accelerated, and it works across all, all of the devices that we could target uh, with WinJS. Correct. Uh, we can also take a look at this. Um, we 
as soon as we added the stock, we called this helper show upper, which show this di different set of commands. Um, there is a handler for the edit uh, that allows you to select particular items in the list. In this case, I'm selecting one. Whenever I click delete, um, we are going to see here that is this delete selected handler gets called. Uh, we are going and getting a, like the reference to that particular list view, this um, stocks right. list view. Yep. The list view has a property called selection, which allows you to get the indices of the items that are currently selected. So we go in descending order through those indices and delete them from the binding list, which internally is going to trigger notifications that the data change. Yep. And then the list view, um, if we do it right now, when I click delete, the list view is going to go ahead and play the animation and delete the item um, from the UI. Yeah. Now I have a question for you. Um, so a, a lot of the patterns that I'm seeing here is we're getting, we're getting data from a, a server. We're uh, wrapping that in some sort of observable collection. Uh, and then we're putting that in our UI. And so a lot of other JavaScript libraries that I've seen and I've worked with, and even in our own, we have this mm -hmm. concept of a, a thing called a repeater, mm -hmm. where you could build that same list view-like experience mm -hmm. um, you know, using HTML primitives like uh, unordered lists and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, what does the list view give you that's, okay. that's different than just you know, stamping that out with, with your own repeater? Right. Uh, so the main, like, we always refer you to our main site that displays the, list of the set of controls. Uh, one of the main uh, assets that the list you, the main co things that the list view gives you is the ability of visualization. Um, you can imagine that you have a list of, or a data source that has 20,000 items, and then we obviously don't want to displace all, the, have all those 20,000 items in the DOM. Right, so, if I used a repeater, I would have 20,000 items actually in, in, in the DOM if, exactly. I, if I was to do that. Exactly. So one of the main things in the list view, which makes it, um, it's, makes it more complex, but at the same time more powerful, is the fact that it handles um, visualizing the data for you. So in this case, even if, this, uh, if we look at this scenario, we actually have 8 times 20, 116 items in this list. Um, when we start scrolling, it looks like uh, we actually have them only, all, all of them in the DOM, right. but we actually don't. We actually only has we calculate how many items uh, fit in the viewport, and then we have uh, extra pages, and we ensure that the panning performance is, is good. Um, in addition to that, the list view also na handles uh, keyboarding for you. Um, like, we want to make sure that uh, all these controls are really high polished and they work well with touch, with keyboard, uh, with mouse. Um, there are other features in the list view, so that, such as like reordering content, uh, and one of the main ones you can do groups. Uh, you can have groups in your list that are the option of creating multiple different layouts. In this stock sample, we were actually using list layouts in and grid, all, layouts. And grid layout yeah. in all the scenarios, but you can actually even have the option to create a custom layout, and then the list view also handles animations for you whenever you, um, whenever you change the binding list that is associated. When you use the repeater, um, you will see that it's um, stamping uh, the content many times, but it doesn't necessarily give you visualization right. um, in your, for your scenario. Right, and so in your case, you thought to yourself, well, the end user could have as many you know, stock favorites if they wanted to, um, and so you'd, you preferred the, the open-ended virtual, UI virtualized list as opposed to stamping out, and you wanted things like animations, and so um, you were able to to just drop that in, use our models, and connect that up to some data, and uh, we kind of, the, the system or the framework took, kind of took care of the rest for you. Cool. Exactly. Awesome. Let's switch to the slides um, for a second. Sure. And let's go to... Let's Learn more? Awesome. Yes. So uh, I think that concludes the yep. demo. I mean, we could talk you know, endlessly about uh, the type of JavaScript controls that we have. Uh, available to you, but um, we actually would like to encourage you to actually participate with us. Right. Um, and so our call to action is really uh, take, a, take a look at WinJS. Um, 
uh, go to our GitHub, file pull requests, issues you may find. Um, if you're building a Cordova app, let us know. Let us know the, the platforms that you're targeting. Um, we have a, a good browser matrix um, that we do our full on, um, we do unit testing on every check-in uh, to GitHub. Um, but there might be some, uh, some platforms that uh, we haven't actually gotten to yet that Windows might actually be running on. Um, we, just haven't, we just haven't had the time to, to test it yet. Right. But you may be writing your Cordova application um, targeting that specific mobile platform. Right. We encourage you to go to our GitHub page. Uh, again, WinJS is now uh, open source. It's in GitHub. It is cross-platform. Uh, we have we're constantly creating uh, many new different features. that are many exciting features coming uh, in the future. Very recently, we added a content dialog uh, control. Uh, if you are, have been tracking our commits, there was a split view control that went in uh, in the past week. So we really encourage you to use our GitHub page, um, file issues, uh, ask questions, uh, visit our try build WinJS site where you can have a playground and have a see in action how all the controls work. And, and again, ask us questions. We're really happy to, to always uh, triage every issue and answer questions. Uh, we also have in the references, uh, in the slides, we also have um, link to our status page. Um, every time that we do a commit in GitHub, we actually automated the process of running all our unit tests in um, Sauce Labs, in Sauce Labs yeah. uh, which is an open source um, solution. So it's very exciting. Every commit, we ran all our unit tests for every component in IE 10, IE 11, Safari, Firefox, iOS, uh, Far um, Chrome. Yeah. So, so yeah, so it's, it's exciting stuff. Yeah, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the one last thing that we'd like to show you is that since um, Edgar's been doing everything in Cordova, and since we're actually just running an HTML5 uh, JavaScript application, um, you can take that exact same code and deploy it to a website. Um, and so here we actually have the watch, the, the stocks app running um, full in a, in a web browser, and this works across uh, IE, Firefox, um, in Safari, on Mac. And so this is really kind of the, the, the first look um, at doing HTML5 development, deploying it to web properties, deploying it to mobile devices using Apache Cordova. Um, and we think this is really exciting. Uh, we're making lots of progress. And uh, we, we would love to have you guys uh, contribute, uh, talk to us on Twitter, Stack Overflow, all of the, the regular spots for developer questions. Um, and so with that, we're going to wrap up uh, this module. Um, and we hope that you, uh, you stay tuned for the next module. Uh, we're going to mm -hmm. talk a little bit about uh, more cross-platform development. Some WebGL is on the way. Um, and so we just like to, uh, on behalf of the entire WinJS team, we'd like to thank you and uh, take uh, WinJS for a try. Thanks. Thank you.